Hello, everybody. Welcome back, you know, to our ETS 2021. It's day three. I'm Joyce Dooley, Senior Research Analyst, and I'm very excited about this upcoming panel. We're going to be talking about effective asset maintenance for the evolving utility. Joining us today is Randy Bauer, Director of Asset Strategy for Alliant Energy. We have Christian Kohler, VP of Transmission Asset Optimization for LCRA, and Carol Johnson, VP at Clevest R&D IFC. How's everyone doing today? Good. It's nice to be here today. Thanks, Joyce. Yeah, no, it's really fantastic to have each of you here. You know, we all understand that a scheduled or reactionary approach to asset maintenance will only increase in efficiencies and headaches as the grid changes and ages. Um, this, in addition to climate impacts, as well as the move to decentralization, is continuing to accelerate, just adds to the problem. Um, so would love to kind of dive into uh, a few things like how are utilities addressing the challenges that come with the new mix of assets and how they're managing all of this operational data. So if you guys are ready to go, we can just dive right on in. Okay. Awesome, mm -hmm. love it. Okay, oh, quick reminder to the audience. If you guys do have questions, please drop them in the chat. We will be able to see them and answer throughout. Would love to hear from you and get your questions answered. And with that, we'll kick it off. So the business model of the utility is rapidly changing. Uh, what are some of the ways in which the traditional monopoly is evolving in response to market pressures and decentralization? Carol, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Joyce. And, you know, that, that's kind of a meaty question, isn't it? But, uh, you know, in, in my perspective, looking at this, uh, I think we're seeing a lot of like new players coming into what's traditionally been uh, a utility space. Uh, and the, the most recent example I've seen in the news is uh, Tesla's recent application to the PUC to become an energy retailer in Texas. And while they're certainly one of the better known names in uh, the energy storage uh, solution space, they're certainly not the only ones that are that are looking at making an entry into into that traditional utility space. Uh, and if we look at the other end of the scale, though, I think a lot of utilities are starting to expand their traditional and, and primarily regulated business models uh, to look at launching, you know, largely unregulated home service divisions, for example. Uh, I've seen utilities offering everything from uh, heating and cooling, uh, water heater, uh, solar lease and purchase programs, as, as well as service plans, so ongoing services to those customers that have those, uh, those sustainable and uh, additional assets behind the meter. So leveraging the utilities, you know, large and experienced workforce to offer those new service to consumers. So we're, we're seeing a blend uh, or a blurring of the lines between the traditional utility business model uh, and some of the new consumer, consumer activities that are happening in the marketplace. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, certainly a lot of new entrants. Tesla is a great example. Um, you know, Elster is based in Austin, Texas. Uh, and, and so they're new to the neighborhood, new in our backyard, uh, a customer of ours. Uh, and, and so, yeah, very kind of front, front and center um, in, in, the, in the industry and in the, in the local scene, I guess. Um, and, and so, yeah, lots of new and different things. I, I just want to mention also, I feel at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of asset maintenance is kind of very fundamental, very core to core to what you do. If you if you don't have that as a utility, everything else kind of falls apart. Um, I think of it sometimes as as blocking and tackling. You know, if you don't have that as kind of your bedrock foundation, um, you know, it's hard to be safe, efficient, reliable, and, and compliant. You know, it has so many hooks into so many different things that. Um, make a utility go and our kind of core values for probably a lot of uh, utilities out there uh, that you, you've got to get it right. And, and there's low hanging fruit, high hanging fruit. There's ways to do that. There's challenges. I'm sure we'll get into some of that. Uh, but, you know, asset maintenance, man, you really got to get a handle on it or, or else everything else just almost doesn't matter in, in some ways. Mm, good point. Thank you. Randy. Yeah, about the only thing I have to add is Iowa is a little bit different in, than Texas in that we continue to be a regulated state, so we don't have energy marketers in the sense of what Texas does, but, but we are seeing a lot of customers putting solar in, solar behind the meter, and so we've developed net metering rates and, and things like that, and, and so, so those become some challenges in terms of circuit loading, uh, transmission facilities investment things like that to accommodate some of that so it, it does represent some challenge and i think the other thing we're going to be interested in is FERC order 2222 which allows customer owned der to 
maybe be aggregated into the marketplace and, and what does that look like and what kind of challenges is that going to ultimately uh, prove to provide to utilities? Definitely a good point with that. Thank you. Um, so what role does asset management play in grid modernization efforts and what is the cost to, to utilities that don't keep pace? Randy, do you want us to take that one? Yeah, so so from, from a perspective of an, of an investor owned utility, uh, we're under incredible cost pressure right now. Um, you know, we, we genuinely have a competition in the marketplace and customers can put in their own DER and rely upon us for, for backup. Um, so I don't think you necessarily have to be the lowest cost provider, but you've got to provide some good service. But I see asset management a little bit as a, a service enhancement where you're on top of some of these things right before they fail. I, I also see it a little bit as maybe an opportunity to to get a little bit more out of your assets. You're a little bit smarter about how you load some of those assets. You understand loading patterns a little bit better. Uh, here in Iowa, we put in AMI about two years ago. That gives us remarkable insight right down to the customer level in terms of what they're seeing for voltage, what they're seeing for momentary outages. Really lets us be a little bit proactive in terms of we're seeing things like voltage issues on a particular feeder or something like that. Okay, let's go out and solve that before that becomes a customer complaint, or let's solve those momentaries before that becomes a customer complaint. So, so that's where I see a lot of effective asset management come into play. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Yeah, those are all really good points, Randy, and and you know some of that AMI data has certainly been a game changer in in terms of uh, you know predictive asset management and taking care of that before it becomes a reactive customer complaint, as you said. Uh, and you know, in, I don't think it's a big secret, but in case you haven't heard, you know, utilities are, are very asset centric businesses, uh, and as Chris was mentioning, you know, it is the the core fundamental. If you don't get that right. Uh, then, then the foundation of the business, you know, collapses under the weight of, of poor asset management. And, um, you know, managing all those assets effectively, as, as Randy was talking about, is, is really the challenge, you know, optimizing the expected life cycle uh, of your existing assets, uh, and also, you know, trying to free up that capital, it's only becoming more expensive to maintain, you know, an aging infrastructure that's been out there, you know, sometimes upwards of 100 years now, uh, where the grid's been in place. And in minimizing the cost of all of the inspections or repairs uh, that, that you need to leverage advanced technology like AMI solutions and, and more strategic thinking to not only um, stay within your current operating budget, but also free up capital for grid modernization projects, because it's no longer good enough to just sort of stay the, stay the line or, or keep the status quo. Uh, the, the grid is transitioning and, and the, the, the business model of the utility uh, whether it's it's behind the pace of you know highly regulated still and you don't have new energy players coming into the market, there is that move to sustainability and the move to decarbonize and decentralize the grid that is happening and is going to impact all utility business. But really, you know, I, I think that's still just chipping away at the surface of the problem. I mean, grid modernization is, is a huge challenge. I mean, bigger, I'd say, than than when the grid was first was in place because. Now, it's not just about deploying assets and maintaining them. You've got to uh, keep the lights on. We've all become so dependent to the services that the utility provides that you, you now have to have that uh, reliability and sustainability uh, working hand in hand. So keeping the lights on, the water and gas flowing, uh, the powers our homes and our businesses, uh, but keeping consumer prices low. So it's kind of that chicken and the egg. Nobody wants their, their utility bill to, to skyrocket while we all want change. So the utility is now being uh, pressured on both fronts to improve reliability, make the transition, uh, while also in a lot of cases, uh, setting more aggressive carbon reduction targets than I've even seen the states or, or the provinces here in Canada set. So they're really leading the, leading the change, if you will, uh, and adapting to new market entrants uh, that I was mentioning earlier with, with the Tesla example. Uh, I mean, how hard could it be, right? <laughs> it all sounds, sounds pretty simple to, to change and adapt to all of that. So in addition to being more efficient and, and strategic in the asset management programs, uh, a lot of utilities I've seen are starting to look at alternative funding sources uh, for grid modernization projects, uh, whether that's government stimulus funds, you know, partnerships with state, city, or local businesses, 
uh, or even new revenue streams. I was talking about the home services earlier, uh, but even EV charging stations. Uh, you know, I think that the cost of not keeping pace, as you're asking earlier, Joyce, you know, what, it, what is the cost to the utility? Uh, I think the cost of not keeping pace uh, will be too high for any utility or, or really the planet to pay. Uh, the entire way that the utility is doing business uh, and relating to the grid, <clears throat> excuse me, is changing. Uh, and embracing the change and finding new ways for the utility to stay relevant in that new world uh, will not only help them thrive, but but survive and uh, sorry, survive but thrive in that new landscape. I mean, you made some pretty fantastic points. Thank you, Carol. Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Carol, get out of my head because like. Yeah. <laughs> I saw those great thoughts there, Chris. I had to plug yes. that. <laughs> yes, no, you, you you put that very well, and uh, and I agree with all that. I think I think consumers in general expect more. It, it's 2021. It's not kind of the same old kilowatt hour. It, it's not just the lights on most of the time. Uh, it's some of the things Randy touched on with with power quality. I was a power quality engineer in a, in a previous life, and uh, yeah, well, same life, previous job, I guess I should say. Uh, and, and so that's a very real thing. And I think those expectations kind of just ratchet up every every year, you know, kind of continually. And, you know, you're right, as an engineer, uh, we can do a lot of things. It's just going to cost a lot of money. The challenge is to provide that optimal service, uh, get the most out of your assets like Randy touched on um, without breaking the bank. And so to do that, you usually got to get smarter. And that means data. And if you know, you're looking at data and whether it's AMI or other data sources, um, condition-based maintenance, things like that, um, that brings a host of other challenges with it that are not always in a utility's wheelhouse, things like data governance. You know, they may know real well how to, you know, hang the line and, you know, take the outage and do the switching, but data governance, data quality, you know, everything that has to go along with that to derive, uh, you know, everything that follows uh, from an asset management strategic perspective uh, is the challenge. I think a lot of utilities are kind of grappling with that. How do I take the mountain of stuff I've got, distill it into something actionable, you know, and then chart a, chart a course on whatever that may be, whether it's your oil circuit breakers that, that need to be changed out, whether that's your Electromechanical relays that need to be upgraded to improve clearing time so you can clear faults quicker so your power quality is better. You know, everything kind of tracks back to that, you know, consumer that has higher, higher expectations, uh, but also not, again, wanting to break the bank. So that's, that's the fun challenge that I think utility folks uh, face in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ways today. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because uh, my favorite quote that I heard a couple months ago that I, I like to repeat is nobody calls up the utility and thanks them for an outage because it's been, you know, a year or three years since the last outage and, and gives them a kudos great job. It's always every outage is unacceptable uh, in this day and age. Our, our expectations are through the roof in terms of reliability. And right in a lot of cases. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, again, really great points all around. Um, you know, speaking of data, Chris, you know, managing data, as you kind of mentioned, is one of the biggest headaches within the utilities. Can you explain what the operational data landscape looks like for utilities now and how it's changing? There, there's a lot out there. Uh, you, you almost need a, a data guru, data czar, data VP, you know, to really kind of you know, get your head around it. And, and it's very much uh, a matter, I think, systems thinking, you know, you're not solving just this one little problem. That's a subset of kind of all the other challenges that you've got. And so you've got to think, you know, how do I dashboard this mountain of data? What kind of mashups, you know, are going to be most effective for telling me what I need to know? You know, I've got, I've got a dollar, I want to put it in the best possible spot. And I've got another dollar, what's the next best possible spot? And there's so many constraints, right? You can't, nobody has an unlimited checkbook. Nobody has unlimited resources. You, you, you can't take um, outages necessarily always when you want to. So you've got to uh, layer in all these constraints and, and figure out, you know, what is the plan for, you know, your upcoming fiscal year or whatever time frame you're looking at. Uh, and, and that's tough. There's it's the art and science of putting your, you know, capital plan together balancing all those different drivers, things you've got to get done, all the constraints as well. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully data helps you do your job, you know, better and better and more, more optimally. Um, you know, I don't know that 
especially as you scale up systems. You know, we've got over 5,500 miles of transmission that we, that we own or operate and over 420 substations. It's beyond human capability. You know, you can't, can't rely on, you know, Jerry or Sally who kind of know the system well, you know, to get stuff done uh, necessarily and make good decisions. You've got to have a systemic approach. Uh, you've got to be able to, to scale it uh, and you've got to keep it going even when folks win the lottery moved to wherever, you know, there's a business continuity aspect to it also. So it, it's all those things that, that are challenges that, you know, we, we, we gotta, gotta get a handle on. No, thank you so much. Randy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, Chris hit on a lot of it. I think in our situation, I think it's fair to say our data is pretty fragmented. We, we've got systems that maybe were developed to solve a problem here and another problem here, and we don't necessarily have a, a full view of, of the assets across the, across the system. It's maybe a maintenance record on a gas valve in one system, and maybe a maintenance record on a pipeline in another system. And so how do you put that together? Um, the other thing I worry about a little bit is just the size of the data, the, the amount of the data that's coming in, and how do you make sense of it? What's meaningful, what's actionable? what's interesting. And so I, I think we, we struggle with that sometimes as well. And I agree with Chris, it's the data governance, it's the data quality, who owns the data, who's responsible for scrubbing it, making sure it's accurate, all of those things. Um, so, so we're gonna spend a lot of money on, on IT systems in my company over the next 10 years. Mm, thank you, Carol. Yeah, I, I, I love this question. And I, I think Chris and Randy have brought up some some great points. And, and I think we're, you know, we're certainly living in the information age. You know, we've got the smart grid and the Internet of Things. And, you know, with all of all of the information that's coming at us, uh, it can be difficult to make sense of it all. And I, I agree with Chris, it's beyond the, the range of human comprehension now to uh, distill all of that and come up with the valuable actions that need to be taken without without the use of technology. Uh, whether that's your AMI, your GIS, your enterprise asset management systems, your workforce management systems, uh, you, you have all of these technology pieces that, as Randy was mentioning, uh, were put in place to solve a particular problem. Uh, and they, they all solve that problem, it's great, but now you have all of these uh, data silos or fragmented information in different owners throughout, throughout the utility. And, and I think one of the biggest barriers to sifting through all that information and getting those you know, eureka moments of, of what you need to do and, and what where the problems are uh, really starts from breaking down those data silos and, and making sure that the information is available to those that, that need to take action. But really one of the, the, the starting points to understanding, you know, what we need and, and what we need to know uh, and if there's any gaps in the data that we have available to us to, to get those, those insights. So I think Chris was mentioning you know, really having a, a vision of where we want to go and what we need to know, and then working back to what information do we have available to us and, and filling the gaps that you may have in between. So certainly, you know, data lakes, uh, if, if people are familiar with that, that concept, we could call it a data ocean these days, but uh, bringing all of that siloed data together, uh, amalgamating it into a repository that is able to then be distilled and sifted through uh, by operations managers working closely with, you know, the, the, the new role that we're all looking for, the elusive data scientist, which used to be called a business analyst, but people that can work with operations managers to sift through all that information uh, and come up with those actionable insights. But I, I think going hand in hand with that, you also have to target those data gaps that, that I mentioned earlier and, and having a plan on how you wanna capture the data that you're missing to come up with that big picture, uh, both efficiently and cost effectively. Uh, so, you know, a good, good example I've seen uh, in the field is while you're out there doing other uh, work, uh, whether it's customer service work or outage operations, whatever it may be, uh, filling in and adding part of the, the, the um, work order completion information data captured uh, as part of your field activities so that the, that information can be flowed back up into the business and help fill those gaps and give you the big picture that you're looking for. 
Awesomeness. Yeah, uh, really fantastic points, the three of you, and definitely highlight some of the challenges that we're all facing and the fact that there's just more data coming all the time, right? Just because we are currently struggling to deal with it doesn't mean this tap ever really turns off these days. Um, Carol, speaking of some of these emerging technologies or the use of technology, we did get an audience question. Um, so I would love to kind of hear your answer on this. Do you see AI playing a role and in what time frame? Yeah, no, there, there's been a lot of chatter about AI and, and ML, machine learning as well. Uh, and I, I think these are, are tools where the technology is, is starting to come together to uh, provide information without having to have as much, uh, you know, user input or data input from, from out, uh, outside of the, the technology. So more and more solutions are starting to leverage AI and ML uh, to be able to take information and glean those insights and surface them for people then to be able to put uh, a little bit more of human insight and, and action on top of that. So everything from you know, scheduling systems are starting to take advantage of it to uh, asset management systems uh, where really they're, they're able to do that uh, you know, for lack of a better term, the grunt work of going through and making sense of all of this information that's flooding at us. So I, I think uh, technology is definitely getting smarter uh, and it needs to get smarter still to keep pace with the, the rapid changes that we're going through, which are only gonna accelerate as technology and climate change and everything else comes at us. So we really need technology to evolve and hopefully not into you know, the Skynet of the world and, and take over the world kind of concept, but you need technology to evolve and get smarter uh, to help us get a, a handle on the complexity uh, of the business that we're working in today. Awesome, thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, definitely spot on, uh, Carol. I, I, I agree with, with an awful lot of that. Um, you know, here at LCRA, we're looking at a AI, different use cases. Uh, one particular one that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, as a result of having the GIS group and our remote sensing drone folks um, is, is using your drones to acquire your imagery when you're doing a, a wood pole inspection, for example. Uh, that way you can you can fly a line, so to speak, maybe get away from climbing every structure if, if it's not necessary, bring back data that is then captured and available for different experts to look at different SMEs uh, to review uh, from a vulnerability analysis, engineering loading analysis. You know, on your drones, you can capture visual imagery, you can hit, hit infrared as well. If you're looking at that, you can do a LIDAR point cloud uh, and bring so much information back. And again, that's that mountain data that we've been talking about. You gotta have a place to put all those bits and bytes and figure out how it flows and manages. But that's hugely beneficial if you can, you know, fly the line. Now you're you're safer and more efficient, you know, not going up and down, maybe not every pole, maybe only every third pole or fifth pole or some subset of, of everything that you're looking at. Uh, and and you've got something that you know ideal in a more perfect world an AI can can look through and, and dish up, here's the, here's the 100 things out of the 500,000 that we think, you know, need to be looked at more detail. Then you winnow it down to the 50 that, you know, require some sort of uh, improvement. Again, back to reliability and power quality and all those things. That's the end game, really. Mm -hmm. in, in this. Um, but I think, I think that's just one AI ML type use case that, that I know we're, I, I'm really excited about. There's a ton of other use cases, I, I think, in that regard across the whole utility space, um, operational data, event data, uh, and you know, very rich field. It, it's almost uh, more a matter of uh, what do we want to focus on? What do we want to do first? What's that maybe low-hanging fruit use case that we can use to kind of get our feet wet and kind of kind of figure out you know, the ropes uh, and then go to some higher hanging fruit is kind of how I, how I think about it. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, Chris, and I've seen utilities use uh, image recognition and AI for even installations in the field. So if you've got contractors or your own workers out there uh, doing repairs or, or new implementations, being able to take an image and compare that against a you know, gold standard of a, of a good job uh, and recognize uh, artificially, if, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence, if there's any issues before they leave the site. Definitely that, that change detection, whether it's a substation environment or, or a, a right away vegetation management. I mean, we could have a whole separate three days probably on that. But uh, yeah, it's a fun topic. <laughs> We've now gone into a new tangent panel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but before we before we get back to our main set of questions, Randy, I'd love for you to weigh in on AI. 
Yeah, we're just starting to dabble in it. I, I mean, I totally agree with everything Chris and, and Carol have said. We're just starting to dabble in it, but we've not done much with it other than, than look at it and consider some use cases. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for the question. Um, so, Randy, you know, to kind of get back into gear, can you speak more to the shifting customer dynamic with the rise of the prosumer and how regulators might be hindering uh, utilities' abilities to best serve those customers? Yeah, you know, that's a that's an interesting challenge. Um, and I say that because in Iowa, we're pretty much a traditional cost of service, rate-based utility. Um, it, it's sometimes hard uh, to, to have some some cost justification, I'd say, for some of these new technologies. And it's a little bit hard to say, hey, how is this going to play out? Um, you know, I think about things like electric vehicles. Gosh, we've dabbled back and forth on should the utility be in, in the charging station business and, and how do you get cost recovery? And, you know, it's one of those things that's really hard because what's the payback going to be? I, I don't think we know some of these things and, until you get them out there. You know, the same thing with batteries and storage. What's the payback on that? Gosh, it's pretty new technology yet. Don't know. And, and, and I think there's also a certain reluctance, I guess. I mean, I think about things as simple as, as prepay on AMI meters. I, I, I'm convinced there's an element of our, of our customers that would, would love to see that. But, but that's a tough sell because that's that kind of goes against what some of those traditional rate regulated utilities, disconnection rules. How do you how do you deal with prepay with a customer when you're in a moratorium like we have from the first of November to the first of April? And what happens if they don't prepay? I mean, it, ju it just opens a whole host of issues that, that um, I think regulators really struggle with. And, and, and so I think it's a little bit incumbent upon us to maybe take some of that and, and take that to our regulators and try to explain why we think some of this is beneficial, uh, where we think it's going to go. Probably all of these new technologies, not all of them are going to be a home run. We're probably going to have some, some flops in some of those, but I think that's how you get better. And I think that's how you develop products for, for your, your customers that benefit your customers. Great, thank you so much, Randy. Carol? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Randy just said. You know, I, I, I do think utilities have a, a real, you know, culture of caution, uh, quote unquote, uh, in, in large part, I believe in response to the limits imposed by, by regulators as uh, I've certainly seen and, and uh, just heard some, some comments from Randy there that show a lot of innovative ideas coming from the utilities. Uh, there, there's of course a, you know, a natural tendency for regulators to be cautious because uh, they don't want to see utilities experimenting with ratepayer dollars. Uh, so I, I think the real challenge is getting regulators to stop thinking in terms of ratepayers and starting thinking in terms of customers and, and customer choice. Like people, uh, you know, it's happening maybe slower, slower in some regions, but there is an opening up and a, a, a change and a transition that's happening in the market that is giving more consumer choice. Uh, and that way, utilities must be more aggressive and uh, innovative in, in how they're approaching serving their customers. I mean, utilities have been uh, pretty secure uh, in a relationship between themselves and the customers in the past, but you know that is changing. Uh, and I think there needs to be more incentive uh, for utilities to you know, run pilots and, and take some of those um, you know, business cases or ideas they have and prove them out so that you don't have to always run a, you know, multi-million, multi-year project uh, you, and be able to fastly prove out the business case on some unknowns because it is new technology and it's really hard to take it off the shelf and, and say this is what the, the result is going to be of putting in a new, you know, mega pack storage, uh, battery storage uh, facility and, and run more renewables in, in, your, in your energy mix. Uh, unless you're able to prove that out with, with some smaller pilots and, and feelers. So yeah, really empowering utilities to, to take reasonable uh, and rationed risks to encourage innovation and accelerate rollout of new products and services. Awesomeness. Thank you so much, Carol. And Chris? 
I think on the utility side, it, it takes vision of leadership to, to do a lot of the things that, that Randy and Carol touched on. You know, that, that new thing, you got to stick your neck out a little bit, um, maybe potential for a great, great big win for, for your company or your customers, your consumers. Um, but there's some risk associated with it too. Um, you know, that's, that's okay. Um, I think utilities are all in different places in their comfort level. Uh, that's a great quote, Carol, on the uh, sort of environment in utilities that, that very much ring, rings true uh, in, in, in terms of caution. Uh, and so, you know, you'll, you'll see some things advance in some environments and, and others not. Uh, and, and that's fine. Uh, it's, it's just a big, big melting pot generally. Um, you know, what I know though is physics and science is kind of undefeated. So kind of whatever the best solution is going to be is eventually going to get there. Maybe a matter of time uh, for, for cost to land where it needs to, for business cases to kind of money out, for the ROI of the net TV to fall into place. Uh, but they will eventually. And so you need to be thinking about those things. Um, I think a lot of the, the things that Randy touched on in terms of uh, like EV penetration, that to me is an impact analysis. You know, let's let's look at some scenarios. What does that do to our our load base, our infrastructure, our needs, uh, and and let's know that you know in advance of it coming. Um, the, the other thing I I think about is new technology often takes new rules. You know, okay, it's a new widget, a new black box. It does X and and outputs Y and you know, how does this live in our regulatory kind of framework that is already there and is existing? Uh, you you, you got to be able to, you know, accommodate the new stuff that you're kind of onboarding into that environment uh, with whatever rule structure you have. And, you know, ERCOT's very uh, stakeholder driven uh, and, and you've got forums and, and working groups and ways to kind of vet issues, bring them to the table and, and have voices be heard and, and kind of do, you know, like a democratic vote on it, which is great. Um, and, and that's the type of environment I think you need to figure out the new rules, uh, certainly inform policymakers, uh, you know, on ramifications and things like that. Education is a big piece of it too. Uh, those are all the things that kind of got to fall in line to, to cross the finish line and, and declare success, have something that ultimately benefits uh, the end use customer. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then, you know, Chris, I would love it if you would uh, kind of tackle our last question first, which is what opportunities exist, right? We've talked about the challenges, we've talked about some of the barriers, we've talked about these different elements, but what are some of the real opportunities in this climate and how best can utilities take advantage of the time that they have now? Yeah, great, great question. And that's going to vary for each different entity, probably, you know, you got to look at what your, your core values and kind of business model is. So there's no one size fits all kind of answer, but certainly sort of a, a method methodical approach, you know, feels appropriate to work backwards from kind of where you want to be. Uh, you know, make sure at El Serio, we always talk about what's the why, like, what's my motivation? What am I what am I doing this for? Let's let's make sure we get that good. If, you, if we've got that good, everything tends to fall fall into place. Um, you know what we're seeing more and more in the Austin area, Central Texas area, really growing and booming. Talked about Tesla coming in, um, other economic development opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of this can be sort of a differentiator for a for a community for a region. Uh, you know, and that's often what how I think about some of the asset management, asset maintenance sort of things. You know, if you can do all those things right and have a great track record in terms of safety, reliability, efficiency, compliance, um, then, you know, that usually attracts uh, what you're looking for, uh, which tends to be a lot of the economic development type of, type of uh, things and activities. Um, so, uh, that to me is a huge, huge opportunity. And, and then, you know, I think back to the, the use case I mentioned on the AI and the remote sensing and drones. I, I'm always looking for ways to make, make uh, the workforce safer. You know, if we can uh, decrease the number of truck rolls, make a truck roll more efficient. Um, I think Carol touched on that when you're out there, have a mobility solution to make the most of that, you know, 100 mile trip to a substation in West Texas or whatever. Uh, those are some of the more compelling use cases that I think uh, are are ripe to kind of dig into and, and really yield yield benefits. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that perspective. Randy, what about you? Yeah, so so we've got about a million retail electric customers and about 
400,000 natural gas customers. So we're really focused on the customer and, and that customer service aspect. And, and you think about a transaction with Amazon or somebody like that, it, it's online, it's pretty flawless. And, and so I think for us in the retail business, we've really got to pay attention to our customers. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to give them more insight into if you want a service or something like that, and we're going to tell you, okay, we're going to be out there Tuesday morning at nine o'clock to run that service. And I think some of that gets into that asset management and that, that workforce management in terms of effectively managing uh, those resources. I mean, it's things like customers don't like their yards tore up and we walk away and, and don't don't tell them we did it and, and and some of those things like that a couple of other things we found on on the distribution side is we, we're doing a lot of voltage conversion from either 12 kV to 25 kV or maybe 4 kV to 25 kV we always is so as part of a voltage conversion you've got to take outages to, to maybe do some of those cutovers so we always did that during the day because we presumed most people were at home working. Well, now with the COVID and everybody at home, things like that cause you to rethink uh, things like outage schedules and, and things like that. Should we do more of that in, in, in evening? I mean, after people are in bed. So, so we're looking at, at things like that. When do you schedule outages? Um, uh, you know, I think it is, we don't necessarily have to be the low cost leader, but we've got to differentiate ourselves with service. And we can't be an incredibly high cost uh, provider uh, it is really what I think is going to help take care of our customers, at least for those of us in the retail side. Great. Thank you, Randy. Very good perspective and a lot of really great insights. Um, Carol, would you please close us out? Certainly, uh, it's hard to top both Chris and Randy there in terms of you know where they see the opportunities uh, sitting for for the utilities. But you know, I, I do think there's there's a whole range of new business opportunities that are emerging. So um, every time you have a challenge, you have an opportunity on the other side of that challenge to to balance the scales if you're lucky. So I, I really think with um, the the shift to sustainability, uh, there is new opportunities that are emerging. Uh, I mentioned home services earlier, but uh, you know, with the drive to electrification of the utility's own fleet, uh, or getting into the EV infrastructure business, whether it's rolling out um, uh, charging stations for for the city or what have you, or even their own EV infrastructure that's mainly idle during the day when they're out uh, doing services, uh, making that available uh, and uh, to the consumers to use uh, at for a fee as it goes through. I know BC Hydro here in Vancouver, where I'm based out of, has done done that. So there's a flow network throughout the city that we can all take advantage of. Plus, it's uh, in place for for Hydro to charge their their electric fleet. And, and you know, I, I think taking advantage of uh, public funds that are coming out. So Biden's just announced, uh, you know, the stimulus fund and the infrastructure bill. There's a lot of money that will become available that will allow uh, utilities to take advantage of some of that public funding to to uh, hasten their move to sustainability and the digital transformation. Well, thank you so much, um, all of you. I think this was a really excellent discussion. I think we got into some nitty gritty details about asset maintenance and management, as well as operational data challenges and the opportunities that exist, as well as the shifting dynamics that we're all seeing across multiple facets of the industry. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, coming up next is gonna be All Thrust and No Vector. Um, that's gonna be hosted by George Hunt, Chief Strategy Officer and GM in Europe and Asia, um, SED from SEW um, and they'll be with you in just a few minutes. And with that, I hope you guys uh, tune in soon. Thank you.